morning. Wasn't that a cute little box for Corey Pink? Like that? Um, I thought it was, what's that? Corey's box. Y'all need, I know, right? It's a good color. Y'all need to get him a bigger one. He didn't have a book up here in the choir loft. He had to share a book. I'm telling you. I'm taking shots. What's that? Ah, oh, his pajamas. Corey has hot pink pajamas, everybody. That's right. Only men wear pink, you know? You know? Um, all right. Let's grab the reins before this goes downhill, all right? Turn them in your Bibles this morning to Mark's Gospel. We're going to be continuing our study on the Gospel of Mark, um, uh, which records the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, I wanted to start by making a statement that someone made to me uh, years ago that I've never forgot. I uh, had a very near and dear friend, an older man, who uh, really spoke into my life and uh, poured into my life. And, and he said, um, you know, Kyle, there is no way to know where God will take you if you fully surrender to Him. There is no way to know where God will take you if you fully surrender all that you are to Him. And I'm here to tell you this morning that God wants to do something in and through your life. You hear it all the time. Uh, if you come to church regularly, you hear God has a plan for your life. But, 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 but here's what I want it to hit you fresh with this morning. Are you walking in the life that God desires for you to walk in? Are you walking in step in the power of the Holy Spirit ministering? as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I ain't never called to be a minister. No, you ain't never been called to be a preacher. You've been called to be a minister. Every child of God is called to be a minister of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. God desires to do something. It doesn't matter whether you're 70 or whether you're 15. He desires to do something in your life. There's just one thing in the way. You. You. Jesus said in Luke 9.23 that if anyone desires to come after me, be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Let those two words sink in. Deny yourself. Deny yourself. That, those are two words that are not spoke about talked about enough in our culture today, deny yourself. Not get as much as you can get, not, 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 not have the best life now that you can have, not, not, not gain as much material possessions or enough peace and blood. Deny yourself. I love the fact that Jesus is the ultimate picture of what it looks like to deny yourself. Because that means that I serve a Savior who won't ask me to do something He hasn't already done. Amen? He doesn't ask me to deny myself if He wouldn't be willing to deny Himself. And He is the uttermost picture of what it looks like to deny Himself. The last time we were together, we looked uh, on as Jesus took on head-to-head -head the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious establishment as a whole. And we learned that Jesus, He didn't come to play church. He came and was sent by His Father on a mission to seek and save that which is lost. And He would not be distracted no matter what the scribes and the Pharisees said about Him or planned to do to Him. Jesus came to save. And He's intentional and He's missional in His mindset. He will accomplish His purpose while He's on earth. So I want to talk to you today about and Jesus' popularity and the opposition that Jesus faced. Because Jesus is the uttermost example of what it looks like to deny yourself, but also to be obedient to the mission that God has called you to. 
Uh, and we can look at Jesus' life and we can glean some lessons that we can pour into our life and ministry. Because whether or not you believe this or not, and this is going to be a stretch for some of you, you have been given a ministry. You've been gifted by the Holy Spirit. You've been blessed by the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have a ministry within the church, in the building. It might be at your job. It might be, uh, it might be a, a, a phone calls that you're making to people to try to bless them. It may be on a ball field. It may be a number of different places, but you have been given spiritual giftedness and spiritual empowerment and a ministry. And so we need to learn what happens whenever we take that step of obedience and try to walk faithfully with Him. And uh, so we, we see very clearly through the life of Christ uh, that that purpose that He came to save, that He came to do good and He came to save by preaching and teaching and healing. That's what He said in Mark chapter 2. And while Jesus walked the earth, He gained fame and notoriety for His ability to heal and even... Uh, on one occasion we saw that there were so many sick and so many demon possessed people that were coming out to Peter's house where he was staying that uh, literally he healed people and cast out demons all night long and uh, I mean that's, that's intense work that's going on there consider this <coughs> remember the woman there's a story of a woman in the Bible who had a blood disorder does anybody remember and she crawled through the crowd and she thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I could be made well. And she crawls through the crowd and as soon as she touches him, Jesus being surrounded by many people, stops and says, touch me. And the disciples said, many people are touching you. People are bumping into you all the time. And he said, no, the power has gone out from me. So if one woman who was sick touching him, if he could feel the power leave him, what must it have felt like to stay up all night long healing many and casting out many demons? you reckon Jesus was tired? I think so. I think Jesus was exhausted. I think he was extremely tired. Uh, Jesus gained fame and popularity, uh, and, and, and he cast out demons and healed all night. But as that popularity grew, as people began to hear about Jesus, so did his opposition. Important lesson. As you seek to walk with the Lord, as you seek to glorify Him through your life, you should expect to be opposed. You should expect to be opposed. If you say you're walking with Christ and yet you face no opposition, what I find is something unbiblical in your statement. You will have some form of opposition. It might be in the form of a person. It might be in the form of life or circumstances. But you will face difficulty. It ain't going to be smooth sailing. Whenever you walk with Jesus, Jesus said in this life, you will have trouble. And so you should expect to be opposed. Jesus walks into the temple and he heals a paralytic. Or excuse me, he heals a paralytic inside of a, a house as they lower him down through the ceiling. Then he walks right into the temple and he heals a man with a withered hand. The Pharisees begin to ask questions. Remember, he says, who does this man think he is? Speaking blasphemies. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And in their judgmental rage, they couldn't see that Jesus was God in the flesh. And that was the message that Jesus was trying to send to the world. He opposed dead religion. And then as the tension had built towards Jesus, He healed another man on the Sabbath. And this led the scribes and the Pharisees to seek to find a way to kill him. And that's what you see uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6. It says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. And that's what you see. The Pharisees went out and, and tried to figure out a way to destroy him. And that's what happens when the servant of God obeys the plan of God. He always has the enemy of God trying to destroy what God Himself is trying to accomplish. Now, I just had a conversation. I just had a conversation Wednesday night. Uh, and I've had many talks just like this. Where a person will say to me, you know, God really convicted me about something. In my marriage, my life, 
and God really convicted me, and I repented of that. And I placed my faith and trust in Jesus, and it seems like ever since I did, my life has been terrible. And you know, it's it's always I always smile when I hear that, and they always look at me like I got three eyeballs. They're like, "Why are you smiling?" What I'm telling you is, I, I'm going through it right now, and I'm smiling, I'm smiling because. You've, been, you've had a mark placed on you. You're trying to be obedient to Jesus. You've repented of your sins. You're trying to walk in obedience to Him. Now all of a sudden you've got difficulty. Jesus said, praise be to God. Praise be to God. Because right now at this moment, you have become a threat to the enemy. See, Satan doesn't attack people who aren't trying to impact the kingdom of God. Satan puts marks on those who try to impact people for the kingdom of God. That's who he wants to slow down. That's who he wants to torment. That's who he wants to try to kill, steal, and destroy from. He wants to derail us from our mission the same way the scribes and the Pharisees tried to derail Jesus from his mission. That's what the evil one desires. And every time I hear that, I want to just shout, yes. Yes, keep going. If life is falling apart and the wheels are falling off and you're trying to be obedient to Jesus... That is called the Christian life. It won't sell you a book, but it's true. Jesus faced opposition by being obedient to His Father, and we too will face opposition when we are obedient to our Heavenly Father. And that's the point of this passage. And this might not be for you this morning. This message may not be for you. You, you may have never taken a step uh, where you've come to faith in Jesus and you've surrendered to the Lord at all. <coughs> where you actually die to yourself and ask Christ to work in and through you. And can I just say something? The life lived in total submission to Jesus is a hard life, but it's a life worth living. It's a life worth living. You'll never regret it. If you're being a witness and you have a ministry within your realm of influence, whether it's at school or work or wherever you are, if you are letting the light of the love of Jesus Christ shine through you, then you should not be surprised when you face trials and opposition. It is to be expected. And this is for you this morning. I mean, if Jesus is not exempt from those things, then neither are we. So today, I want us to just look briefly at what Jesus faced and how He handled it. And uh, I think it's going to serve as a good example for us as to how to handle the issues of life as we try to walk with Jesus. First of all, I'm just going to throw out four things and then we're going to rock and roll. You ready? Number one, Jesus faced an overwhelming responsibility. Number two, Jesus faced trouble within his immediate family. Number three, Jesus was lied about publicly. And number four, Jesus embraced a larger family. Number one, Jesus faced overwhelming responsibility. Anybody in here ever been overwhelmed? Yeah, yeah. You ever been overwhelmed? The train cars just start running into each other. Smack, smack, smack. And you just think, oh my gosh. I mean, what else could go wrong? I mean, goodness gracious. I've got this due. I've got that due. I've got this I've got to get done. i got this. And you got all of these things. If you look at our world today, we are more busy now than ever. And that's not a good thing. It's a very, very bad thing. We've forgotten how to rest. We don't understand how to rest. And what we call rest isn't even rest. We're working. Or we're doing something. You say, how do you figure? Well, because now, used to, you had to go to a computer to get an email. Now you can get it right here on your phone. Right? You're working nonstop. you got things to keep you busy all the time. The American people are so busy that that's the greatest weapon that Satan has against us. We forgot to prioritize because things are so busy and chaotic that we can't prioritize. <coughs> you ever felt like you were in too many places at one time? <laughs> but too many people, by, by too, you were wanted somewhere by too many people at the same time? You ever felt like no matter what you did, people just wanted more and more and more and it was becoming unhealthy to you and your family? No one understands this the way Jesus did as he walked here on this earth. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine? As Jesus blessed people, and he healed them as sons 
and daughters were being restored as prostitutes were experiencing new life and fresh hope and demon-possessed people were being set free as the poor was being preached to the gospel of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden they didn't feel left out anymore as people are feeling this fresh sense of hope that they are a part of something much bigger than themselves they press in on Jesus. He leaves the house in the morning. Not only is there a crowd waiting on him, they're wanting him to do something for them. There's a crowd within the crowd who wanted to catch Jesus in some wrongdoing so they could put him to death. This is immense pressure. Most of us don't know what it's like. Not many of us walk out of our front doorstep to have a crowd of people pressing in on us, wanting something from us. We get to go get in our car and drive somewhere first before that starts happening, right? Right? But even though God, Jesus was God in the flesh, He was still in the flesh. And the Bible tells us that He was tempted in every way as we are, and yet He was without sin. And as this pressure mounted up on the back of Jesus, we need to look at how He handled this situation. And in seeing what Jesus' priority was during this season of pressure, we can learn how to better handle our seasons of pressure as we seek to Walk obediently to God. So, what would Jesus do as the pressure mounted on him? As he felt like he was getting sucked dry. What would he do? What would he do? Would he just suck it up? Try to push through no matter what he was feeling on the inside? No, that's what we do. And more often than not, when we do that, we've, we wear it as a badge of honor. When really, what ends up happening is you make mistakes. You make mistakes. When you push through, suck it up and push through, and you are empty, you are trying to lead people on empty, you make mistakes. Because you're not, you can't pour out onto people what you don't have inside of you. You say, well, did Jesus need that? I don't know, you tell me. Go read the Gospels. Every morning, he'd disappear. He'd go up on top of a mountain by himself, even to the point where many times the disciples would come to him and they'd say, hey, where you been, man? Everybody's looking for you. And Jesus is off alone on a mountain by himself. Jesus teaches us the importance of solitude. Look at verse 7. Jesus withdrew with His disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea. <coughs> I mean, at this point, He's got momentum, right? I mean, think about it. I mean, why would Jesus not just continue healing and working? He just showed the Pharisees up. He, he just showed the Sadducees up that He's not going to be distracted from His mission, mission. But now the Bible says that He withdraws. He desires to get away from the crowd. He and his disciples leave the temple after healing the man with a withered hand. He says, hey man, let's go down to sea for a while. My kind of, my kind of guy. Let's get down, let's go to the beach. Alright? Let's just go to the beach and get away for a little bit, right? He didn't press through the difficult times. He prioritized time alone with his father and with his inner circle. Jesus would go off, the Bible says, every morning to a different location. Oftentimes it was to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray alone with the Heavenly Father. And if that was the priority for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to be alone with His Father, then it must be a priority in our life. I mean, if the Son of God needs to be alone with His Father, then I need to be alone with my Heavenly Father. And while we know that, we don't change anything. If you can't say amen, you better say ouch, right? Because it's true. We don't change anything. We agree with that. But we don't allow it to change us. And that's why we're stuck. And that's why we're weary. And that's why we're tired. And that's why we're needing refreshment. That's why. If, if this was a priority for Jesus, it's got to be a priority for us. You must be alone with your heavenly Father every day. 
I don't care if it's in the morning. I don't care if it's at night. I don't care if it's on a mountain. I don't care if it's in a boat. I don't care if it's on a bank somewhere. I don't care if it's in your car. I don't care if it's in a parking lot at work. You need to be alone with God. Look at the persistence of the crowd. Verse 8. So a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Edomia and from beyond the Jordan and from Tyre and Sidon. And when the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And Jesus is trying to pull the escape hatch. Look at what he says. Look at what he says in verse 9. <coughs> he tells his disciples, hey, y'all, get a boat ready for me. <laughs> he tells his disciples, get a boat ready for him because the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, verse 10, so that they who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever, the, and whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, 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 try to get your mind wrapped around this site for a minute. They walk out of the temple, a swarm of people crowd around them. They gather around Jesus, they're pressing in on him. And he's just got hundreds of people just everywhere just clamoring for him. He gets all the way down and he gets to the beach. And here's what he would do. He'd get down right at the water's edge. He's run out of room. He's on the edge, and here's what he'd do. He'd say, guys, go get me a boat. So they, the disciples run off to go find a boat, and, and they'd bring a boat back. He did this several times in the Gospels. And what he'd do is he'd just climb up in the boat and put out a little ways so that people weren't crushing him. And then he'd teach them from the boat. He'd heal from the boat. And then it also gave him easy escape route because then he's in the, he's in the water. Right? And he can get away so he can, so he can, you know, Jesus had to eat, right? Jesus had to do some of those things that we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily think about Jesus eating. I mean, he's God, but he was God in the flesh. And so he had to eat. <coughs> I mean, he's right at the edge of the water, and they're all getting a boat. He's healing many people, the Bible says. And as the demon possessed would come up to the water's edge and see him, they would just see him now, they would fall on their faces and cry out, You're the Son of God! And Jesus would say, Shh, you hush your mouth. You don't tell people who I am. Why would Jesus do that? I'm going to tell you two reasons why he would do that. Number one, number one, demons, demons didn't need to be the ones exposing who Jesus was. Why? Because you'll see in a few verses, because the scribes and the Pharisees were already saying that he was the prince of demons, right? So if they were corroborating his story, it might confuse people as to who he really was. So he says, hush, that's one reason. The other reason was this, is because he knew that if this truth continued to come out, that they were going to try to kill him a different way. And Jesus knew he had to go to the cross. This was God's plan to save the world. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, cursed is the man who hangs on a tree. You see that over and over in Scripture, that the Messiah would be raised up like the snake in the wilderness, that he would be hung up. And so Jesus knew, I have to go to the cross. Jesus said, I have to go to the cross. They tried to press in on him at one time and throw him off a cliff. And Jesus slipped through the midst of them and they pulled a Houdini and they were like, where'd he go? Right? Why did he do that stuff? He did that because he knew that if he didn't go to the cross and pay for the sins of the world, that there would be no salvation for you and me. Right? Thank you, buddy. And um, <laughs> Jesus knew he had to hang on a tree and become a curse to set you free from the curse that was placed on every man and woman after the fall. So Jesus faced overwhelming responsibility. He had crowds needing healing and restoration. He had enemies lurking in wait to kill him. He had disciples he needed to train. And he had the plan of his father to keep. He was overwhelmed. And he made personal time alone a priority. Let's zoom in on that time briefly in verse 13. <coughs> it says, And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. Now, this proves that Jesus went up alone first. The fact that he had to call those whom he desired to him 
implies that he was alone and had to call and send for them to come up, right? And so uh, Jesus went up alone. He had to have some time alone with his father. Actually, if you look in Luke chapter 6, it actually says that he prayed all night long before he made this decision that he's about to make. He prays all night long. And he calls those whom he desires. And look at what happens. It was a moment that these men were not ready for. Look at verse 14. He appointed twelve whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. These men were being called to the office of minister. And Christ was giving them authority to act on his behalf. And the Bible tells us that he gave them a new mission and a new name. No longer were they to find their identity in being fishermen or tax collectors. These were now ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, if there's not, if there's not a lesson for you today, this is the lesson that you need to take. That, that Tim is not Tim the teacher. That Nathan is not Nathan the ag man. That Eddie is not... He's not the carpenter. I, I, I don't want to call him carpenter because you do carpentry all day long, right? He's not the carpenter for the school system, right? That Kevin's not the professor at the, the college that he's at. That Bud's not the farmer. That Connie's not the nurse. No, you are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there's no other lesson that you glean today, you need to understand this. These men had to totally unpack themselves from what they'd always known themselves to be, and they had to be who Jesus called them to be. It's no longer the fishermen standing here, it's the ministers. <coughs> and look at what I find interesting. He said that he appointed Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. He gives him a new name and a new mission. Verse 17, he, 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 he appoints James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges. I think is how you say it. I don't know. It's a weird name. All right. Uh, but it means the sons of thunder. It's my favorite. He had two hotheads on his team. I can relate to that. I can relate well to that. And it gives me hope because I'm quick-tempered and I get hot under the collar and God's had to tone me down quite a bit and He has. He's humbled me. But at the same time, there are those moments in time where I just, boom, my mouth just takes off. And I don't think about what I'm about to say. And Peter and James fit in that category really well. Peter's the one that snatched the sword, chopped the dude's, chopped the, dude's uh, the soldier's ear off, right? He's like, what are you doing? Puts the ear back on. You know, Peter's the one like, Jesus, I ain't going to let you go to the cross. I'm going to die for you. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Peter just opens his mouth and starts to foot all the time. And I, 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 I love Peter for that. But look at what he does. <coughs> he picks Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. And Simon the Zealot, but here's my favorite part. Are you ready? Verse 19, he picked Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Here's the question. Why would Jesus appoint that man as an apostle knowing what he was going to do? I'll tell you real quick. You ready? Because he was appointing these men for a specific work. Jesus here blesses his enemy and calls him to be the one to betray him. Because without Judas, there's no cross. Without Judas, there's no betrayal. Without Judas, there's no 30 pieces of silver. Without Judas, there's no cross. And if there's no cross, there's no salvation. You know, every so often, we need to thank God for Judas. As wicked as he was, and he was not a Christian, but as wicked as he was, if he had not done what he did, there'd be no salvation. And Jesus lets you know the sovereignty that he has when he appoints him 
And he says, yeah, you got to work. You're going to be my betrayer. And I'm sending you off to do your work. That's what's happening there. It also teaches us, and it serves as a dire warning, that you can walk with the people of God, you can work in the house of God, and never know God. Jesus faced overwhelming pressure, but Jesus also faced opposition from within his family. Look at verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could, couldn't even eat. Verse 21, and when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, and they were saying he is out of his mind. They're at Peter's house again. The crowd gathers up so thick they can't even eat. He's trying to meet needs. He's trying to bless it. And when, He's trying to teach, and when his family hears about it, they go out to see him saying he's out of his mind. You need to learn this lesson if you're trying to walk with Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Listen to me. You ready? When you walk within the plan of God, you need to be prepared to be opposed by many people. But this is probably the hardest. When, you, when the people you love the most begin to ridicule you, but not just, not just the people you love, and trust the it's the people that you trust the most. Your mother, your father, your sisters, your brother. This is hard. The question is, are you going to remain faithful to Him even if they're not? Not everyone has the same commitment to Christ that you do. And if, you're sold, and if you are sold out, committed to the cause of Jesus Christ, you should expect to be opposed by your family. Really? Yeah, actually, Jesus said, I came not to bring peace but a sword. To set father against mother, to set sister against brother. Did you remember him saying that? End of the gospel? Guess what? Whenever I surrendered the call of ministry on my life, it was so funny. My mom, God bless her, she is the most beautiful woman. I love her with all of my heart. Do anything know I die for her right now. But you know what she did? She carried me to church. She tried to share the gospel with me. She prayed for me, her and my, and if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't, get, wouldn't have been at that revival and gotten saved. All the seeds they planted, all the time they prayed. But can I tell you a secret? When I got saved and God called me into the ministry, I'll never forget that conversation. I walked in and I said, I believe the Lord's calling me into ministry. Her exact words were, no, he's not. I said, yes, he is, mama. And she said, no, he's not. She said, no, he's not. You're going to go to school. You're going to get an education. I said, yeah, I know. I'm going to Bible college. No, no, you're not. And I remember thinking, wait a minute. You, 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 you got me in church. You helped me see Jesus. And now I want to serve Jesus. And, and mama, you ain't going to let me go to school. What are you doing? Preachers don't make no money and they always get a bad reputation. That's what she, she said, but serving the church. I am. I'm going to be a preacher. He told me. No, you ain't. That hurt. So you know what I did? I called my dad. I said, hey, dad. He said, what? He said, yeah, I feel like God's called me to be a preacher. He said, yeah, your uncle said the same thing. Call me in another year or so. Went and told my uncle, who felt that way at one point in his life. You know what he said? Yeah, come talk to me in about two years. If you still love Jesus that way, then, then yeah, maybe. But in the end of the day, listen, those, those, those are the people that I trusted. Those are the people that I respected. And you know what? They were telling me something different than what God was telling me, so I had a choice to make. Was I going to listen to man's wisdom or what I knew God was telling me? And I will never forget it. My mom comes in. I got the computer open. I said, what you doing? So I'm filling out an application to BCF. She said, what's that? I said, it's Bible college. And she was like, I thought we already had this conversation. I said, no, you had this conversation, but I talked to Jesus, and I'm going to listen to him. And she got mad. But she got over it. And she's been one of my biggest supporters ever since. Here's something practical for you. Husband, I really want to start a Bible study in my home. I really want to start praying with my wife. I really want to be the man that God called me to be. But I know that the minute that I start, it's going to feel awkward. I'm not going to know how to do it. <laughs> and so I'm just not going to do it. Let me, can I tell you a secret? God wants you to lead in your home. Well, I'm 70 years old. I'm 80 years old. So what? 
You think God still doesn't want you to leave in your home? My kids are all grown and gone. What does that matter? Why not, why not let your latter years be better than your former years? If you're young in here, won't you stop making excuses and understand this? God wants you to lead in your home and step out and get the Bible open and you watch what happens. It'll be weird. It'll be awkward. It'll be chaotic. It won't always work right. But you're doing it. You're doing it. And at the end of the day, your kids are seeing you do it. And I don't have this right. I've had it right for a long time. But I'll just be honest with you in confession. Right now I've been being lazy. I have been. So pray for me in that regard. Women, if your husband never prays with you, you, some of you need to know, some of you in here right now, you might not realize this, your husband may want to do something like this with you, but they are afraid to death of you. Because they're afraid at the end of the day, oh, you want to do it now? That, that's, what, that's what they're afraid you're going to say, right? So what you, the biggest thing you can do is be his biggest cheerleader. And maybe you should go to him and say, you know what, I want you to do this with me. If you feel like this, I want you to. And then give him an opportunity to do it. And, but then once he starts, cheer him on. Don't let him forget. Cheer him on. Hey, hey, hey are we going to do that tonight? Even if it's terrible, it doesn't matter how good it is. It gets better. You just got to start, right? God will bless the home that's in prayer together. Maybe you, maybe you need to get the Bible open with your kids like people used to. Josh and I were talking about this this morning. We were all talking about it. And all the men sitting there, we're all talking about this. They need to see Daddy open the Bible. And talk about Jesus. Why would Jesus. Why would his family do this to him? He's crazy. Because they love him. What? The same reason why my mama wouldn't, didn't want me to go to Bible college. Because she loved me. See she, she, she was concerned about my physical earthly well being. And so were they about Jesus. See, they heard all the people talking. They knew who wanted him dead. They knew they were plotting to kill him. And they said, we got to do something to get the monkey off of his back. Because if we don't, they're going to kill my boy. And so the, the whole family comes down to the house and says, hey, he's crazy. He's saying that he's son of God. He's not really. He comes from our house. He's just, he's just a little. He's losing his mind. He's coming with us. They're trying to save his earthly life. They don't understand what he's doing. People aren't always going to understand what you're doing when you take the step from being just another Christian to being a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ. And there is a difference. One, it's one thing to believe something. It's another thing to allow your belief to change your life and transition into action. So Jesus faced trouble with his immediate family. <coughs> But also, Jesus was lied about publicly. Mark 3, 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebub. And by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. So, you ever been lied about publicly? You ever have people slander you and you find out about it later? How about this? I'll tell you, I've seen this a lot. You ready? But we're not going to talk about me. We'll talk about somebody else. I saw my, my, my best, one of my best friends back home. Uh, <coughs> he, he felt like God was calling him to lead a Bible study. Now, he was a wild child just like I was and ran around with the bad crowd and he had given his life to the Lord and now he wanted to lead a Bible study. So he goes to the pastor. He says, I want to lead a Bible study. Some people inside the church had caught wind of it. Pastor said, let me pray about it and I'll get back with you. Next thing you know, weeks go by. Weeks go by and he never is teaching a class. So I went up to him and I said, Seth, why aren't you aren't you teaching a class? And he said, well, I don't know. I talked to the pastor about it. He's not, he's not getting back with me. I don't know what the problem is. So I go to the pastor. I was helping lead the men's ministry at my home church at that time. And I went to him and I said, hey, what's going on with Seth? You know what he said? 
Well, I was told this, that, and the other about Sarah. Really? Who told you that? I know him really well. And that's a lie. No, no, no. I was told this, that, and the other. You know, can I, can I just be honest with you? I, I'm just going to, and I say this a lot, but I hope one day you'll let it sink in. Can I tell you a secret? One of the worst marks against the Baptist church is we don't know when to shut our mouth. It's true. It ain't just the preacher. The preacher's just long-winded. But gossip is the queen of the Southern Baptist church. Or the king. Sometimes men gossip worse than women do. They just got back off the fishing retreat, so y'all have to give me all the good dirt when we're done. But anyway, so, but the bottom line, I'm joking, but the bottom line is this, is that it's a real problem. It's a real problem. And it's amazing. It's amazing how some people never talk ill about somebody else until that person sees them doing something for God. Well, they ought not be doing that. Did you, did you see how he acted in the gas station last week? Well, uh, that's, that's fine and dandy. He can teach Sunday school class all he wants to, but you ain't seen how he talks to his wife. Who are you? Who am I? Seth was delayed quite a while until these things came to be found out that they were not true. And Seth was not doing anywhere near what they were saying he was doing. But what was he trying to do? He was trying to walk in obedience to Christ and all of a sudden, lies. Lies. And he called out to them. They say, he's possessed by Beelzebub and by the prince of demons. He cast out demons. And he calls out to them and says, how can Satan cast out Satan? If, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, he is divided and he cannot stand. But he's coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. <coughs> Jesus doesn't try to evade their lie. He just simply responds with logical truth. He says, listen, Satan can't drive out Satan because that would be his demise. And then he makes a statement that nobody can steal from a house with a strong man unbound. What Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, you think that these demons are strong because they can bind men and I'm coming in and I'm binding the demons. I'm stronger than they are. Jesus is stronger and evil, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. But look what he says. Look what he says. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he had an unclean spirit. <coughs> These men were calling the work of the Holy Spirit the work of Satan. And there is no greater blasphemy than this. And this is the only sin that is unpardonable in the entire Bible. Only someone who hates the work of God could say this about the work of the Holy Spirit. But what they don't realize is that they are condemning themselves. You say, Pastor, I can't believe that you won't just totally denounce tongues. I'm not going to denounce tongues. God can do what He wants to do when He wants to do it. And I'm not going to call something that could be the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to call it a lie unless I don't know. You want to know why? Because I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because He is the red-headed stepchild of the Trinity. We don't like to talk about Him very much, but He is where the power is. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You've called to be a minister, but you will not minister until you seek the Holy Spirit and His power. They're committing the unpardonable sin. They're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But lastly, Jesus embraced a different family. Jesus embraced a different family. Look at Mark chapter 3, verse 31. 
his mom and them came back again. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus embraced an extended family. This is representative of the church. Jesus is telling them here, while I know that you all are biologically mine, okay, (coughs) these who I'm with will be part of my eternal family, and I must spend time with them while I'm here. This is something important to understand, church. If you are earnestly desiring to walk with Christ... You have to embrace the extended family you are now a part of called the church. You cannot say on the one hand, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I I say this all the time because it's the best picture. You come up to me and say, Kyle, I just love you, but I can't stand Amy. Well, bye. That's my bride. Right? And if you're a woman and you say that, I just say bye. And if you're a man... Well, sons of thunder. That's all I'm going to say. Right? And uh, I'm just kidding. But anyways, you have to embrace the church. We are the bride of Christ. The Bible says you exist for others. Now, I wasn't planning on going here, but can I, can I just say something and just let it sit where it sits? There's a song by Casting Crowns. It's beautiful. And I'm going to sing it one Sunday. And if I had a voice, I'd sing it right now. He says, have you heard of the city on a hill? Said one old man to the other. The one shined bright and it would would be shining still. But they all started turning on each other. And one by one, they ran away with their made up minds to leave it all behind. And the light began to fade in the city on a hill. And then there's a bridge and this is what it said. It was the rhythm of the dancers that gave the poet's life. And it was the fire of the, it was the, uh, it was the uh, spirit of the poets that gave the soldiers strength to fight. It was the fire of the young ones. It was the wisdom of the old. It was the story of the poor man that needed to be told. And what he's saying in that song is this, is that every single person plays a role in the family of God. Every single person is important in the family of God. You have to prioritize time with your church and your family, just your extended family, just as Jesus did. That's why every morning at 4.30, we get up and go to the gym. Me and three brothers get up and go to the gym. I could sleep. I need to sleep. But we go to the gym. That's why fishing retreats are important. That's why Sunday school eatings on Sunday night are important. That's why going places as a Sunday school class is important. That's why happy group is important. All these are designed to build relationships within your church family, and they are needed. As a bond of a church grows stronger, so does its ministries. Jesus understood this. These men and women needed him at this point in time. But that's not all Jesus was doing whenever he was declaring to his family, even even though, this is what he was saying to them, even though you are my blood relatives, you will still all have to declare me Lord. Even Mary. Can you imagine being the mother of Jesus and having him tell her, you, you're going to have to submit to me as Lord and Savior of your life. That's what he's telling them. James, his brother that wrote the book of James, did not turn to faith in Jesus until Jesus rose from the grave. He was a doubter. I'll just say this. It doesn't matter how well we know Jesus or about Jesus, you must acknowledge him as Lord and master of your life. 
So Jesus faced overwhelming pressure, but He prioritized time alone with His Father. Jesus, Jesus, prioritized alone time with His Father. Jesus also faced issues with His immediate family. Don't think that issues with your immediate family disqualify you from ministry. It actually could be a sign that you're walking the right path. Doesn't always, but it could be. Jesus also, Jesus also <coughs> was lied about publicly. And Jesus embraced a larger family. This was a hard portion of Scripture to preach. Because it's just different. It's just kind of an odd spot right here in the middle of the gospel. But I will tell you this. Jesus is Lord over your circumstances. And His Word is enough to change you. I have, I have two questions as we, we close. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes as uh, Corey or Eddie comes. Uh, Eddie, um, I will, uh, I'm going to ask you two, two questions. The first question is this. there is something if there is something that God is calling you to in your home at your job and maybe you 